Hello, my name is Stephen Billett from Griffith University in Australia. Much of my work research is associated with how people learn through practice. And in this session, I'd like to talk about clinical teaching in practice. That teaching can comprise direct telling or instruction. And that's quite a common um, frequent concept. However, it also includes being selecting and giving trainees particular tasks from which they will learn. And also from observing experienced clinicians, engaging in clinical activities such as handovers, audits and mobility meetings, and other kinds of activities where cases are talked about, and these are inherently rich learning events. And then there's the everyday interactions that occur, the huddles or hero huddles as they're sometimes referred to, and conversations that occur in the work setting. And then there are also those intentional debriefings that occur after critical moments have occurred. The important point about these, this listing is that most of these largely can occur and are often best placed to occur within the everyday work activities and interactions in clinical settings. That is, those activities, that thinking and acting occurs engaged in authentic clinical tasks, which presses trainees into thinking and making decisions along clinical lines. So it's much more than telling. But what are the key principles? Well, firstly, the important thing is to get the trainees to do the thinking and acting wherever possible. That is, put them in the driver's seat, so to speak. Some years ago, I was involved in a project with first and second year doctors in, in England. And what was occurring there was that on the first day of their work as a doctor on that Monday morning, they often found that there was knowledge absent in their thinking and acting, which inhibited their clinical decision making. And that they reported was that they hadn't engaged sufficiently in clinical decision making throughout their training. So it's important then for trainees to be given roles and responsibilities in which they engage in that kind of thinking uh, for which they're ready to progress. That is tasks that are commensurate with their abilities and from which they will learn. And this is important because it's about the readiness both for the ability to practice and to learn. So in extending what they know and can do and value uh, is based upon what they know and that then allows them to learn. If they're put in a situation where the learning task is too great, it can lead to dissonance rather than productive learning. So the questions then are, do they have the prerequisite knowledge to engage in tasks productively and with guidance? And this can be thought of as their zone of potential development, the degree by which their development, their learning will be extended by engaging in those tasks considering, of course, patient care and safety. And providing an appropriate level of guidance and support to avoid trainees becoming overwhelmed by these demands and encountering dissonance rather than effective learning. And also, there are the times to be didactic, to actually teach, and that is when trainees lack the readiness and the understandings and the procedures or when work requirements such as patient safety is such that that is required. But you might well ask, how can I tell when trainees are ready to do and learn? I guess this comes from the frequency of interactions and knowledge of the trainees and then having to find that out. What we found was that some clinical work allows close and frequent interactions over time and that assists ascertaining what trainees know, can do, and value. And also then that permits um, senior clinicians providing the appropriate 
kinds of experience and roles and responsibilities for those trainees. We found, for instance, that at different opportunities to assess readiness and engage trainees occurred across surgery, medicine, and emergency departments. The first two provided opportunities to plan ahead to find ways of engaging trainees iteratively over time and to engage and promote their readiness to continually engage and continually learn. However, in emergency, it had to be done in situ and immediately. There, in, in our studies, um, senior clinicians quickly had to ascertain what new trainees had done previously, what they wanted to learn, and then allocate them roles and responsibilities on the basis of that. So assessing their readiness to engage and undertake those tasks. So there are different ways of ascertaining and exercising trainees' zones of, de of development. And this will be shaped in some sense by the kind uh, of clinical practices in which they're engaging. So this then shapes a view about what is teaching and, and your approach to teaching. Certainly there's no need necessarily to be the sage on the stage, to be the expert who expounds, except when it's required. There's no need to impress focusing on learning on trainees learning is what they report as appreciating and making judgments about the, the competence of the senior clinicians. So it's important to ask questions rather than make statements. It's not difficult to turn statements into questions, give them roles and responsibilities, and importantly, create an environment in which trainees can ask questions and can question. And what we know fundamentally is that people learn more and more effectively than what they are taught. So going back to that first principle of getting the, the trainees to do the thinking and acting is tantamount here. And that needs to be a key principle for clinical teaching. Guide by asking questions, testing conclusions, and of course, praising development and advancement. That can be really helpful to provide a productive, professional environment from which learning and good practice can progress. And as again, work out when there's a need to instruct. While doing so, also consider how you would like to learn, perhaps rather than how you were taught, inverted commas. So that teaching process is to understand the sequence of experiences. This is referred to as the practice curriculum, the pathway of experiences that trainees need to move along. Typically, this is about moving from low to higher risk activities. And more, more risky activities often have greater complexity. That is a, a greater range of compounding factors that need to be addressed. For instance, Sinclair, who wrote a book on training and becoming a doctor, talked about a junior doctors in London being given the task of history taking an examination of patients who'd already had that done by a more experienced clinician. And then they would check with the experienced clinician to see whether what they had concluded were the same and what were the differences. There's also the parallel practice in which a trainee might engage in history taking and examination and then consult with a more experienced practitioner to see if they would come to the same kind of a conclusion. That is used a lot um, in, in some rural settings, for instance, in Australia. And then there's the issue of out of hours work. For some um, situations, out of hours work, that is the work at night, um, can be a very helpful sequenced experience. Some doctors report, for instance, that that's a time where there's not as much activity going on. They um, can consolidate what they know and manage um, a reasonable workload. However, that tends to be in the kinds of wards where patients are often recuperating and, and recovering. Other kinds of out of hours work can be quite stressful if the patients are seriously ill and emergencies might arise. So it's a question then of working out 
how best something like out of hours work might be provided as an experience for trainees. And then the simulation activities that um, can be used to help develop procedural capacities. For some time I was on the Institutional Ethics Committee of, um, of, of, of what essentially is the, the central uh, mortuary in, um, in Brisbane for coronial cases. And we allowed under the Ethics Committee um, practitioners to come in and use some instruments that are used inside the human ear to inspect and um, go down to the human head. We, we did this because there's a risk of making mistakes here, it could be injurious or fatal to patients. So we wanted to provide a safe environment for these practitioners to learn and hone those skills. And by doing it on deceased humans was a, 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 an ethical and important um, practice. And there can be the important task of observing experienced clinicians to develop understandings, practices, and procedures. In one of our current studies, the junior doctors said that they learn a lot from hearing experienced practitioner um, talking to patients, using simple explanations of the conditions that patients have and the way that the therapies or medicines can assist them with that. They, they felt this was, was very helpful because it helped them understand both the, both the conditions and the remedies, but also how these needed to be communicated to, to patients. Then there's the opportunities to see practices undertaken to understand the series of, of steps in procedures and also the dispositions, the attitudes that are being, being practiced by senior clinicians. So also in the development of these capacities, the ability to actually provide opportunities to practice and hone are important. And the importance there of engaging in activities and interactions that have a high learning potential are probably under-recognized as being a very important aspect of clinical teaching. And a lot of these occur as part of everyday clinical practice. This could be the diagnosis of cases, and in particular, activities such as handovers, and the clinical discussions during handovers and audit meetings. So it typically in these type of meetings, including mortality and morbidity meetings, a case is presented, different views are expressed, and then some conclusions are reached about the case and how it will be proceeded with. Now these can be very, very important learning moments because different perspectives are articulated and considerations given to them. And even if the participants may not seem to be articulating and engaging with questions, they may well be following those activities. And if, for instance, they can be reminded that they might be looking after one of these patients or writing one of these reports, that will engage them also effectively. The other powerful thing about these kind of experiences is that often the consequences of decisions made in these meetings can then be evaluated over subsequent time as the particular regime of treatments um, are enacted and judgments made about whether those decisions were correct and what adjustments need to be made. So these everyday activities stand as being you know, potentially rich um, supports for learning examples of important clinical teaching. So it's more than instruction. And aspects of telling though, can include narratives and stories which help develop understandings. For instance, Bridget Jordan in her work with Mexican birth attendants would take a trainees around the village or trainees would be taken around the village and the houses were that they encountered the stories about births in those houses was recounted and the particular circumstances helped enrich uh, the, the, the experience, but also helps recall an understanding. So rather than an abstract 
medical situation it's embedded in a particular circumstance. The same is true of what Sinclair proposed. What he suggested was that, that trying to remember the conditions of something like pneumonia is best done by remembering the first patient you encountered it in. So remember Mr. Smith, because that's a real embodiment of those conditions. And that will help understand the, uh, those, remember those conditions. And remember cognition is about remembering, remembering and recalling, and that can assist with that. And Rice, for instance, also referred to mnemonics, which are as, as, as assistance for thinking and acting. And he referred to the use of sounds that came from when people are learning how to um, listen to the heartbeats with a stethoscope. And he came up with a series of sounds that indicate particular conditions. And the one I remember is he was referring to when a heart valve doesn't quite close, it makes a sound like New York, New York, um, obviously the city in America. And so that was a, a device then to help trainees remember and diagnose that condition through sound. And then the, because so much of this thinking is undertaken by experts in ways that is perhaps unknown to novices, wherever possible, verbalizing thinking can be very helpful for, for making explicit the kind of thinking that clinicians are doing. And then also the opportunity to actually engage in the kind of artifacts which are required for practice, not just encountering them the first time you have to use them in patient care. And what about this issue of professional attitudes and dispositions? What we know is that these, these qualities are often best learnt rather than being taught. And this frequently comes from observations and trainees' judgments about the quality of what they observe. For instance, modeling appropriate practices and when engaging with others, patients and co-workers are things which trainees report as making judgments about what is appropriate practice and inappropriate practice. Being exemplary with your practice such as hand washing, mask wearing, et cetera, that, you, that others are expected to do because that modeling is important. And for instance, being effective with how you engage and also disengage with patients can provide important models, which are tasks which trainees might find difficult to do, particularly that important process of disengagement. And sitting within all of this, is a very, very important consideration. And that is different from teaching as in telling and instructing. What is so important is encouraging trainees to become agentic practitioners and learners, not relying upon their teachers, but rather learning through active observing, deliberately practicing and effortfully engaging in processes that are demanding, such as differential diagnosis. At the end of the day, what is most important is that clinicians become quite self-directed and self-organizing in their learning because that's what will occur across their professional working lives quite often and will be so important in their ongoing development. So in sum, Clinical teaching is ultimately about helping trainees learn. It's not just about teaching. And it's best to build that teaching into everyday clinical activities and have trainees doing the thinking and acting within the scope of their learning potential. And that those activities often provide the ability to monitor the worth of initial decision making. And then as they experience that decision-making, make changes, refine and hone their understandings about what is required for effective practice. And with clinical practice, providing the opportunities to observe, practice, refine, and engage in 
diverse kind of clinical activities to build up an effective repertoire of knowledge and encouraging trainees, as I said, to be active and a agentic, active learner practitioners. And it's these qualities then that can largely occur through everyday clinical practice, which seems to be important. Should you be interested, there are the references to what was referred to in this presentation. I hope there's some worth in this, and I hope this both encourages and supports your efforts in clinical teaching. Thank you very much.